Well, hey, good morning, everyone. We are in the middle of a series that we've entitled Once Upon a Time because we're looking at some stories that Jesus told. Now, don't mean to imply by this title that, I mean, that's the way we introduce stories, but I don't want you to think that these are fairy tales. They're not. They're parables. And uh, hopefully you got a set of notes on your way in today. And uh, if you're watching online, you can uh, get these at centeringlives.com. You can download them right next to the message video. But these are parables, and a parable is a short story that explains, explains spiritual truths by using everyday objects and relationships. So the word parable is taken from an ancient Greek word, paroble, or I think that's how you pronounce it. But, but the idea is that um, it means to throw alongside. So if I lay something down beside something else, then you can see the comparison. So if I want, it's a... So these are earthly stories that help us, help us understand heavenly truths, if you will. So if I uh, tell you a story that relates to my family and I say, well, this is how it is with the family of God, then you have a clue. And that's what Jesus did. He taught in parables a lot. In fact, that's point A on your notes that Jesus often taught using parables. And here's why he did it, because this is the note, parables reveal spiritual truths to those who seek it but they conceal spiritual truth from those who refuse to listen. I mean, you gotta wanna hear it. If you don't wanna hear a spiritual truth, you're gonna just think these stories just are stories. I mean, they don't make any difference. But if you're willing to listen, oh man, there's meat there. There's a lot to chew on. His disciples, we know this is why he did it, because Jesus said so. This is from Matthew 13. Why do you use parables? Or his disciples came to him one day and asked him, why do you use parables when you talk to people? And he replied, well, to those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given and they'll have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. I mean, when you hear these stories today, there's a lot of truth packed in. We're going to go through three of them. They were shared. Jesus shared them a few days before he was crucified. So these are some of the final, final parables he ever told. But we're going to go through all three of them because he went through all three of them in one setting. I mean, where he was talking to some people who refused to believe in him, the religious leaders. Now, to give you some background on this, the religious leaders in Jerusalem at the time when Jesus was crucified, um, they couldn't stand him. But they were divided into two groups that um, conspired together to make sure that Jesus died on the cross. This is a few days earlier, a few days before that, like I said. There were two groups, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the hyper-religious people, ultra-conservatives. They not only believed that you needed to know the Ten Commandments and obey them in the Bible, but they found 613 total commandments in the Old Testament of the Bible, and they had all kinds of rules and regulations to make sure that nobody disobeyed those laws. They were self-appointed hall monitors for the whole nation. And they went around making sure that everybody obeyed the law. This is how you keep the Sabbath. This is how you tithe. This is what you can eat. This is what you can't eat. This is kosher. This isn't. This is that. This is that. And the more rules they had, the happier they were. Because they were the arbiters of who was keeping the score. And since they were the arbiters, they were on top. Does that make sense to everybody? Well, that was one group, and that was the Pharisees and the scribes and the Pharisees. There was another group called the Sadducees, and the Sadducees were people who were the high priest and the other priests that maintained the temple, and they only believed the first five books of the Old Testament. They didn't really care about the rest of it, and they were more interested in political power and wealth, and they'd made some sweetheart deals with the Roman Empire, who was occupying Israel at the time, that they would keep the people in line as long as Rome would leave them alone. And so Rome said, okay, keep the people in line. And then Rome kind of turned a blind eye to whatever kind of corruption was going on in the priesthood. Well, right before Jesus tells these parables, everything comes to a head because it's Palm Sunday where the, these stories are coming from the end of Matthew 21 and the beginning of Matthew 22. Beginning of Matthew 21, just a few verses before we jump in, Jesus is riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on a donkey, a donkey colt. And this is in direct fulfillment from an Old Testament prophecy from Zechariah 9.9, 9, 
where the Messiah would come riding into Jerusalem on a donkey colt. And Jesus knew that. And he did that on purpose. He wanted everybody to know that he is the Messiah, the anointed one, the savior sent from God to save the world from its sin. But the Pharisees didn't like him because he wanted, he came, he said he came to save sinners, which meant that he would interact with prostitutes and tax collectors and all kinds of thieves and criminals. And he would talk to them about God's love and forgiveness for them if they would repent. And they didn't want people to repent. They just wanted people to obey the rules. And Jesus was messing it all up. He wasn't nearly religious enough for them. The Sadducees couldn't stand Jesus because he called them out too. In fact, after he came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, um, the next day he went into the temple and he overturned all these tables where all these money changers were and had cages of animals and he let all the animals loose. And he said, why do you turn my father's house into a den of thieves? It's supposed to be a house of prayer. And they were angry because they had a sweet deal going. Remember, they were interested in sweetheart deals. Here was their sweetheart deal with their own people. They were the ones who would be the arbiters of what of inspecting the animals for sacrifice. You had to bring sacrifice, animal sacrifices. Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. And so the way sins were atoned for was an animal would die in your place. But it wasn't a one-to-one -one sacrifice. It had to be repeated over and over again. So when you made a pilgrimage to the temple with your family and you offered an animal for sacrifice, you'd bring the best of your herd or the best of your flock, just like the scripture says. But every time the priests would inspect it, they'd go, ah, there's a flaw in there. You can't give God a flawed sacrifice. You need to get one of our inspected animals over here. And then all of a sudden you were having to buy an animal from them, even, you'd brought, even though you'd brought a perfectly good animal yourself, and their animal costs three times what your animal was worth. Oh. And then you'd try to buy the new animal and you'd hand them Roman coins and they'd go, we can't use Roman coins in God's temple. You need to use the temple Hebrew shekel. But there's an exchange booth over there with a 30, 40% markup. Oh. So they're making money coming and going. And Jesus comes in, turns over all the tables and says, this is crooked business and you know it. And they were livid. They were also worried that Jesus, with all of his populist preaching and stuff, was going to mess up the deal they had with the Romans. And the Romans were going to come in and clamp down on him. So they said, we got to kill him. Both of them agreed, we got to get rid of Jesus. And remember, Jesus said, when you hear these stories, if you want to listen, you'll hear. If you're not willing... You're not going to get anything out of it? Well, you're going to see that come to play here. They realize that, man, they are on a completely opposite course from him, and Jesus doesn't pull any punches. So today, I want to remind us, and here's a life application, that if we seek God and ask for his direction, his wisdom, his strength, insight, put anything you want in there, we will find him. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, and, and by the way, the Old Testament teachers, they would have known all this. They'd memorized big chunks of scripture. They just didn't live by it. So let me remind us of what Jeremiah 29, 11 says, this Old Testament prophet. For I, know that I have, for I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And in those days when you pray, I'll listen. Listen to this. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. Can we say that together, please? If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. And so the question today is, will I look for God in these stories? Because what you're going to find is this. The stories that Jesus told not only apply to the people of his day, they still apply to anybody who hears them. I'm going to do my best to read these to you and show you a, way, a couple of ways that I think they apply to each one of us. The question before we start, though, is, did you come here today and want to seek God wholeheartedly? Yes. Yeah. Well, then let's ask God to do that. Heavenly Father, today we want to seek you wholeheartedly, not half-heartedly. So, Lord, I pray that our attention will be on your word, not on our phones, not on uh, problems at home, job next week, something coming up this afternoon. Pray that our attention will be wholeheartedly focused on you now. I ask you to speak, Lord, move me out of the way, 
Teach us whatever you want us to hear from these stories, these parables today. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. So point B, jumping back into where we are, a few days before he was crucified, Jesus told three parables that exposed the religious hypocrisy and hard hearts of the Jewish religious leaders who refused to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They had seen Jesus raise people from the dead. They had. They'd heard demons leave people with a shriek. They'd seen it. They'd heard him teach the Bible like nobody had ever taught it. They knew he had supernatural wisdom. They knew he had supernatural power, but they weren't going to listen. It was la, 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 not listening. Not listening. We just prayed now that God would speak to us. So here's the first of the stories. There's three. This is the story of the two sons. But what do you think about this? Jesus said, a man with two sons told the older boy, son, go out and work in the vineyard today. Son answered, no, I won't go. But later he changed his mind and went anyway. And then the father told the other son, you go. And he said, yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. So which the two obeyed his father. And remember, he's talking to the religious leaders. And, and they said, well, the first. And then Jesus explained his meaning. I tell you the truth, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. For John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live, but you didn't believe him. Well, the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe him and repent of your sins. Okay, I mean, look, this is a story of this guy has two sons and they were working the vineyard with him. Now, I grew up on a farm, on a family farm. I, me and my brother... If my dad said, hey, I want you to go work, work out and help me milk the cows today, and I just can't imagine saying, no, I won't go. That would have been a terrible thing. I don't, I don't know what would have happened. I never tried that one. Uh, but it's awfully important to understand here that when Jesus gives us a command, he wants us to obey him out of love and respect that we trust him. And he's never going to do something. He's never going to command us to do something that's stupid or wrong. He's going to command us to do something it's for our good. Well, anyway, the first son said, no. And he was just like the tax collectors and the prostitutes. The tax collectors were people who'd made a deal with Rome themselves. Hey, I'll collect Roman taxes. And they said, good, if you'll be our tax collector, you can add on whatever you think you can get away with. Line your own pockets too. We don't care as long as we get our cut. And so these were considered traitors to their own people. And people detested them and hated them. They were greedy thieves and traitors to their own people. Prostitutes, well, they were prostitutes. They were destitute women. Women didn't have many options in those days. If you were poor and you could sell your body to get enough food to eat, that's what you did. And so, but the religious people had nothing to do with this trash. And Jesus had a heart for them. And John the Baptist had a heart for them. John the Baptist was getting everybody ready for when Jesus came. He would baptize people in the Jordan River. That's why he was called the Baptist. And he would tell them, hey, the Messiah is coming into the world. He started this a few years before Jesus began his public ministry. And when Jesus came, he actually baptized Jesus himself. And he said, hey, when this, man, when this Messiah comes, you better be ready. And they said, how do we get ready? He said, repent of your sin. If you're collecting taxes, don't collect any more than you need to. If you have sinned and you're sexually immoral, stop it. Repent. Repent of your sins. Turn back to God. And people did repent, and they got baptized. That's what was going on. It showed on the outside that they were, washing, they were washed clean of their sins. And their lives changed. Many of them radically changed. And Jesus told these religious leaders, you saw that happening, and you didn't listen to him. And you didn't celebrate with that. You condemned him and said he was crazy. Because you're interested in money, and you're interested in rules. So here's a life application. God wants us to trust him and do what he says, not just pay him lip service. Matthew 15, Jesus had told the same group of people, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. That's the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. You got to keep all 613 rules. You got to. Or else you're no good. God will hate you. You'll never get into heaven. Hey, you got to offer our sacrifices. You got to play by our rules, pay our prices. 
And Jesus had no use for either of them. He slammed the door of heaven shut in people's faces and might make them twice the son of hell that you are. That's what he told them. Mm, good job, Jesus. You tell them off. Yeah. Phonies, lip service. You'd never catch me worshiping on Sunday, then go ahead and looking at stuff I should never look at on. You never catch me saying, Lord, thank you for forgiving me, and then me not forgiving. You never catch me saying, Lord, I love you, and with my lips I honor you. You never catch me talking bad about somebody made in your image. Okay, I'm running out of things to talk about here. I want to tell you, when you read these parables, we're going to read two more. It's good to go, yeah, Jesus, go after those hypocrites. Go after those phonies. Go after those legalists and these pretenders and people who are really just trying to line their own pockets. You won't catch me doing any of that. And then the more we reflect on this, you go, yeah, you will. See, he doesn't want you and me giving him lip service either. Would you turn to the person next to you and say, I think he's talking to you today. Would you do that right now? I think Jesus is talking to you today. Oh, yeah. I think he's talking to me. He who has ears, let him hear. Which was the good son? The son who did what, he, what God wanted him to, not the one who just talked a good game. We got two more stories to go. If I'm stepping on your toes now, you ain't seen nothing yet. Okay, I just want to give you a warning. That was the two sons. Here are the two. Here are the wicked farmers. Let me now listen to another story. Matthew recorded these. Bam, bam, bam. I'm giving them to you. Bam, bam, bam. Just the same way he did it. And these are these religious leaders are standing in front of him. They've seen him ride in on the donkey colt. They know he's claiming to be the Messiah. The children have been dancing. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they told him, Jesus, you hear what these kids are saying? Tell them to be quiet. And Jesus said, if I tell them to be quiet, the rocks will cry out because it's true. Your king has come to you today. And they just lost their minds. Wicked farmers. Now listen to another story. And I don't think he was smiling when he told him this story. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard, built a wall around it, dug a pit for pressing out the grape juice, and built a lookout tower, invested in all the infrastructure. I mean, this, is, this would have been common in their day. I mean, vineyards were common, and this guy had found a perfect hillside to grow wine and built a fence around the whole thing and put a watchtower. There were even, the uh, rabbis even had um, instructions exactly how tall these watchtowers needed to be. This was common. And they would have hired people. They would have, I mean, they would have set up all the trellises that the grapes could grow on. And they'd done all the work. They'd invested a lot of money. Had a wine press in there. Well, after harvest, when the, all the grapes had been squeezed and turned into wine, then they were asking for a, their percentage of the harvest, whether it's 30, 40 percent. I don't know. I mean, they did all the, they did all the investment, front end investment. And so they're entitled to their due. And that was his business model. They dug a pit for pressing out the grape juice and then built a lookout tower. Then he leased the vineyard to tenant farmers and moved to another country. At the time of the grape harvest, he sent his servants to collect his share of the crop, which we'd expect. But, the, but this is where it gets crazy. But the farmers grabbed his servants, beat one, killed one, stoned another. So the landowner sent a larger group of his servants to collect for him, but the results were just the same. Finally, the owner sent his son, thinking, surely they'll respect my son. But when the tenant farmers saw his son coming, they said to one another, here comes the heir to this estate. Come on, let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves. So they grabbed him, dragged him out of the vineyard, and murdered him. And when the owner of the vineyard returns, Jesus asks, <clears throat> what do you think you'll do to those farmers? Well, he's talking to these religious leaders who've been giving him lip service, giving God lip service. Listen to how they answer. The religious leaders replied, well, they'll put those wicked men to a horrible death. And lease the vineyard to others who will give him his share of the crop after each harvest. I mean, they were big on keeping the Old Testament rules, and this is what the Old Testament said. I mean, he was, they're going, oh, we know the answer to that one. That's wrong. And they didn't even realize they were condemning themselves. They will soon. But then Jesus asked them, didn't you read this in the scriptures? And he quoted Psalm 118. You can write that in the margin. This is Psalm 118, verse 22. 
The stone the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it's wonderful to see. I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation that will produce proper fruit. Anyone who stumbles over that stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone it falls on. And when the leading priests and Pharisees heard this parable, they realized he was telling the story against them. They were the wicked farmers. They wanted to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowds who considered Jesus to be a prophet. Hmm. Anybody who does that doesn't pay what the owner of the land, owner of the property wants to collect. They should be. And if they murdered his son, they should be killed. Good. I'm glad you recognize that. Now, let me remind you. In Psalm 118, it says, The stone the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. I'm the cornerstone. Jesus had ridden into Jerusalem on the donkey. I'm the Messiah, and you're rejecting me, God's son. Note, in this parable, the landowner is God, the vineyard is the nation of Israel, the tenant farmers were the Jewish religious leaders, the landowner's servants sent to collect the money are the prophets who all throughout the Old Testament faithfully preached God's word and called the people of Israel to come back to God to repent of their sin. Hmm. The landowner's son is Jesus. God himself sent to proclaim the good news. And the nation that will produce proper fruit is us. Here's the big shocker. Gentiles who've been adopted into God's family through a personal relationship with Jesus and filled with the Holy Spirit. All the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees, they weren't being a light to the Gentiles. They weren't interested in justice and mercy. And that's what Jesus is interested in. They weren't interested in forgiveness. They weren't interested in letting the Holy Spirit flood them. They're interested in keeping rules and keeping themselves on top. They're interested in making a profit and making a deal with Rome and being politically connected. That's all they wanted. And Jesus didn't want a part of either of those schemes. A couple of things to point out. Here's a life application. We must surrender our families, plans, possessions, careers, dreams, our schemes, if you will, to Jesus and allow him to be the cornerstone of our lives. In those days, when you built a house, the keystone that was laid was the cornerstone. It was the most expensive, most well-crafted stone in all the foundation. Get it as nearly perfectly square as you possibly could. And when you set that in place, that's where all the lines for the rest of the building were taken from. So you'd know it'd be square and true. It was the foundation on which everything else was aligned. And Jesus said, I am the cornerstone. If I am your foundation and you align your priorities and you align your life according to how I tell you and how I lead you, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I will help you. I will show you the best. I will give you abundant life. And if that's good news, would you say amen? That's why we can trust Jesus. He's the cornerstone. They wanted none of it. They would tell Jesus, who do you think you are? I'm the Messiah. Tell these kids to stop saying that. They have to say that. It's true. All throughout the Bible, Jesus is, the, I mean, the Lord is the rock. Psalm 42, David said, or Psalm 40, excuse me. David said, he lifts me out of the pit, out of the miry clay, and sets my feet on the rock. He's a rock. He's solid. Oh, this is so important for us to understand. Peter talked about this. And he said, you have to understand this. You're coming to Christ, the living cornerstone of God's temple. As the scriptures say, I'm placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. And he's quoting Isaiah 28. Jesus is the cornerstone. Is he the cornerstone of my life, of your life? No lip service. No, I mean, I really align my life with him. That's why I read my Bible. That's why I want to come to church. I, I want to know what Jesus wants me to do. I want to be like him. And Jesus said, if you do that, man, that's what I want. But that's not what they wanted. Secondly, God expects us to bear fruit. 
I mean, Jesus told his disciples, look, these people have disqualified themselves. They don't want to bear fruit. They are wicked farmers. They're like wicked farmers who just want to take everything for themselves. I mean, they were gouging God's people when they were coming to offer sacrifices to God. They were laying heavy burdens of legalism on people who were coming to get free from their burdens. And Jesus said, don't be like them. He told his disciples, be like this. I am the true grapevine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. He prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they'll produce even more. Remain in me, and I'll remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine, and you can't be fruitful unless you remain in me. And he told his disciples, look, if you pray to me every day, if you focus on my word, if you encourage each other and help each other, then you can stay connected to me, and my life will throw, flow through you through the Holy Spirit. You stay connected to me. My joy will become your joy. My peace will become your peace. I'll give you gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. If you want that, would you say amen? amen? You can have that through a personal relationship with Jesus. It's the only way. Oh, it's what Jesus wants for you and me. I mean, he loves it when we come to him. He says, if you seek me, you'll find me. You stay connected to me, I'll give you my life. They wanted none of it. Now, we got our own way, Jesus. We got our own prophets, profit-making scheme, Jesus. We don't want that. Third life application. How do I respond when God points out things in my life that need to change? I hope you notice this. When the leading priests and Pharisees, I read this a little bit ago, let me read it again. When the leading priests and Pharisees heard this parable, they realized he was telling this story against them. They were the wicked farmers. And you'd think the next sentence would be, so they got down on their knees and repented. No, it says they wanted to arrest him right there, but they were afraid of the crowds who considered Jesus to be a prophet. That's why they waited till they could find Judas a day or two later, and then Judas would betray him, and then they could kill him, get the Romans to crucify him. What about me? Somebody comes to me, John, hey, what you said, that's... John, you, you can't talk like that. What they said to you, a good friend, somebody you trust, a godly person, maybe your mom. Hmm. Do I accept it? Hey, you're drinking too much. You need to get some help. This is your spouse, loves you. Ah, it's none of your business. Leave me alone. I warned you, these are parables. I'm glad Jesus told those hypocrites off. Oh yeah, well, what about me? What about you? What about both of us, all of us? Mm. Jesus said, Prove by the way you live that you've repented of your sins and turned to God, and you can circle the word repent. Repent means do a U-turn. I mean, is that what I do when God points out something in my life that needs to change? That's not what they did. And remember, they were disqualified. They weren't going to change no matter what. I don't care what Jesus says. And he warned them. They wouldn't listen. Parables open the eyes of people who are looking. Just made them mad. Still got one more story to go. You okay? All right. The way, there's the story of the wedding feast. Jesus also told them other parables. Got one more. He said the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. And when the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify those who were invited but they all refused to come. Now, in those days, I mean, they would send out a save the date kind of invitation. And then on the day when everything's ready, they'd kill the animals, roast them, everything was ready. And they'd go, hey, you got to come. Come for dinner. Let's go. It's coming tonight. They would send out people. They'd go door to door, messengers going to every house in the kingdom. And this was a royal banquet. I mean, this is like being invited to the Buckingham Palace, or this would be like being invited to the White House for a state dinner. I mean, like this would be a, 
This would be huge. You got an invitation. And so it would be unthinkable you wouldn't go. But he sent people to tell him, and they, they refused to come. So he sent other servants to tell him. The feast has been prepared. Everything's ready now. Cattle been killed. Everything's ready. Come to the banquet. But the guests he'd invited ignored them. And not only did they ignore them, they went their own way, one to his farm, another to his business. Others seized his messengers, insulted them, and killed them. Hmm. The king was furious, and he sent his army to destroy these murderers and burn their town. And he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, and the guests I invited aren't worthy of the honor. Now go out in the street corners and invite everyone you see. So the servants brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike. If it's good news to you that Jesus came proclaiming the kingdom of heaven is open to all who will come to me, good and bad alike, would you say amen? amen. Man, this is good news. No matter who we are, no matter what we've done. And his banquet hall was filled with guests. And there's one more plot twist here. But when the king came in to meet the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for a wedding. Friend, he asked, how is your in here without wedding clothes? But the man had no reply. And the king said to his aides, bind his hands and feet and throw him into outer darkness for there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. A couple of observations here. First of all, note this. There will be a wedding feast in heaven. It talks about it many places in the Bible. Here's one, Revelation 19. After this, I heard what sounded like a vast crowd in heaven shouting, praise the Lord. I don't do crowd sounds very well, sorry. But <laughs> praise the Lord for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and let us give honor to him for the time has come for the wedding feast of the lamb and his, and his bride has prepared herself. Yeah. A gigantic table in heaven filled with the best foods and all the saints of all the ages are there. David, Abraham, your mom, your dad, the godliest people you know, Billy Graham, they're all there. And there's a place at the table for you, for all of us who know Jesus. And you sit down next to him and you're sitting next to Mary Magdalene. Or I sit down at the table, I just can't imagine this. I turn the person next to me and go, who are you? I'm, I'm John Schmidt. Well, I'm John the Baptist. <laughs> okay, I'm listening to you, okay? <laughs> Woo. How cool will that be? And there's time. There's going to be meals over and over again and feasts forever and ever and ever. If all this sounds great to you, would you say amen? amen? Yeah. And that feast is prepared for all who come to Jesus, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done. But he asks us to come and repent of our sins. And that brings us to the next part. The proper attire for a wedding feast is robes of righteousness. Hmm, Isaiah 61.10, I'm overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God, for he has dressed me in the clothing of salvation and draped me in robes of righteousness. The king had told his servants to go out and bring anybody in off the highways and byways. He knew they weren't going to be dressed. I mean, they hadn't been invited yet. So he knew they wouldn't be dressed for the occasion. So he had robes prepared for them, beautiful wedding robes. They could shower and clean up and have these beautiful new clothes. But here was a guy who snuck in who said, no, 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 no. I don't need new clothes. I'm wearing my old clothes in here. And when the king walked through, he goes, friend, what are you doing? And the guy had no excuse. Because even the robes had to be provided by the king. Peter talks about this in 1 Peter 3. For Christ also suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you God. There was a substitution at the cross. Jesus took our place. I gave Jesus all my sin and shame and guilt, and he took all the wrath of God upon himself. He gave me all of his righteous and all the blessings that were due him. For anyone who comes to Christ, that's what that means. And if I try to earn my own way into heaven and say, God, I want to go to the wedding feast. Now, I believe there's going to be a wedding feast in heaven. But, Lord, I'm not giving up my sinful lifestyle. Lord, I'm not giving up my addiction. Lord, I'm never going to forgive that person. I don't care if you've forgiven me or not. I'm never passing it on. And, God, I'm going to hold a grudge the rest of my life. And I don't care what you say. Well, then you haven't put on the robes of righteousness yet.
We all need robes of righteousness. Without, we are, the heart is desperately wicked. Isaiah 64 tells us that our most righteous deeds are filthy rags. And that's why we got to take them off. Look, we have whole denominations today that are telling people, you don't need to repent of anything. God loves you just the way you are. You don't need to change. He accepts us as we are. That's true. But does he want to change us? Oh, yeah. He wants to change me from the inside out and make me clean. Make me like Jesus. You too. Real quickly, God wants his servants to invite everyone to the wedding. Notice that? Bring in anybody who will come. For God so loved the world. Maybe you've heard this about four times today. <laughs> it's funny in music and in the video and everything. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but save the world through him. That's good news. And one final life application. We are some of the servants of God that are being sent out right now. And in the margin, you could put right now or today. You go, well, John, this is an interesting story because it says that people got, servants got to go out and tell people about Jesus. How are you going to do that, John? John Schmidt, that's your job. You're a pastor. Me, my job is to go to work and then to watch football. Oh, well, though, I'm not going to do that. Oh, mm. Sorry. Too soon? Too soon? Come on, equal opportunity here today, okay? All right. Look. God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. The reason we're still here is not just to make money or watch football or do anything else. The reason we're still here is to be messengers for Jesus, to share the good news with the rest of the world and so we can go to the wedding feast. If you are looking forward to that wedding feast where you're sitting next to John the Baptist or Mary Magdalene or somebody else, who do you want in your family or your workplace or your extended family or friends or your neighbors? Who do you want to go with you? Inside your bulletin, there should be a little Fran card. This is just to keep in your, well, I'm the one who asked to be put in your bulletins. They probably fell out on the floor. I realized that people, I don't know, I dropped it. But if it stayed in there by some miracle, okay, I'm the one who asked to put it in there. If you would be able to put at least one name on here and pray for that person, keep it in your car, just every time you had a stoplight, look at it. In Prattville, you have plenty of time. We got a couple of long lights around here, okay? <laughs> But then you could just pray for them and say, God, would you help me bring, would you give me the right words to say so I can invite my sister, my cousin, my dad, my grandfather, my next door neighbor, my coworker. I want them to come to the wedding feast. They don't know you yet. God's given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. Could we read that out loud together, please? So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us, not just through preachers. There are some people I can talk to that you will never have a chance to talk to. There are other people you're going to have the chance to talk to them that I never will. We speak for Christ and we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. As God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it like the foolish people with the wedding invitation. The invitation was there, they just didn't go. For God says at just the right time, I heard you on the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. I'm going to pray a prayer that goes two directions today, and we'll wrap up with this. First is, for those who have been Christians for a while, am I paying lip service in something? Only pretending to love God, knowing there's things I need to let go of, and I'm hanging on to them anyway? Why would you do that? God wants me to yield fruit. I can't have love, joy, and peace and patience in my life if I'm intentionally going the wrong way. I'm going to have stress and fear and guilt that I'm going to be found out. So will you. 
This doesn't make sense. And those of us who've been Christians for a while, it's time for us to, have you prayed lately for anybody to join you in the wedding feast? When are you gonna start? That's one of the things we're supposed to be doing. Now, you might also be here today, I wanna to go another direction. You've never surrendered your life to Christ. You go, your heart's been pounding the whole time. I, I, I'm one of, the, one of those people who's not gonna make it. I'm gonna give my life to Jesus. Okay, pray for you too. Lord, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And I just pray, Lord, that today you will hear our prayers. For those of us who've been Christians for a while, Lord, I don't, I don't want us to be giving lip service to you anymore. If God spoke to you about some area in your life today where you go, oh, Lord, I've been a hypocrite. Please give me the desire and the power to change. And we prayed at the beginning, if you seek me, you'll find me. If he spoke to you today, say, Lord, I heard you. And I ask you to help me with this. Give me the desire and the power. I, I want to change. For those who are here today, you need to surrender your life to Christ. Pray with me now. Lord, I just come to you and I need my life cleansed. I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I know it. I've been running from you for a long time and I'm tired of running. I give my life to you. I need robes of righteousness. My, I've made a mess of my life. I thank you. Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for all my sins. I beg your pardon for my sins. and I, Please forgive me, Lord. I surrender my life to you. And finally, if you know somebody and you want them to be at that wedding feast, Pray with me one more time. Oh God, I pray for this one person right now. If you will touch their heart, they are far from you. If you know someone like that, God's already put a name in your mind. Pray for them right now. Say, God, touch their heart. If I can be helpful in giving them the invitation, give me the right words to say, I can't do it without your help. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. We pray them in the strong name, the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.